so if we look at the planets in the solar system, uh, we see we have the terrestrial planets. Um, on the smaller side, we have Mars and Venus and Earth. Uh, and so on these planets, the atmosphere represents a negligible fraction of the bulk mass of the planet. Uh, and if we go up the size scale, the next largest planets that we see are the ice giants, the Neptune and Uranus. Uh, and in the solar system, we have nothing in between these two bodies. Uh, that's not the case around other stars. And so what we'd like to know is how big can a planet like the Earth be before it becomes something more like Uranus or Neptune, where it has that very thick atmosphere uh, that is a, a, an important factor in the bulk mass of the planet. Uh, to answer that question, we first have to consider how atmospheres form on planets. Uh, and so there are three main ways that you could form an atmosphere on a planet. The first being volatile delivery, uh, which we see here, where you could have comets or volatile rich uh, meteorites that come in, you impact on the surface, and over time you can build up oceans in an atmosphere uh, via these impacts. The second option is this outgassing. And if we look at the Earth today, we see that volcanoes outgas lots of gases like CO2 and water vapor. And on young planets, this can be much more efficient, uh, where you can have magma oceans that cover the entire surface of these rocky planets, and you could outgas uh, oceans and an atmosphere on very short time scales. And so this is probably how the Earth formed uh, its atmosphere shortly after formation. And the third option is this disk accretion. Uh, and so this is where you have the disk from which the star and the planets are forming, and you have planets that are able to accrete hydrogen and helium directly from that disk. Uh, when they form. So Jupiter and Saturn likely formed uh, via this process and were able to accrete large quantities of these uh, hydrogen and helium from the disk before it dissipated. Even Neptune and Uranus likely accreted a fairly substantial uh, amount of this gas. Uh, but it turns out that even the smallest planets can accrete this hydrogen and helium from the disk before it dissipates. And you only need to be about one-tenth the mass of the Earth, which is about the mass of Mars. And you can start accreting hydrogen and helium directly from the disk before it dissipates. And so we call these atmospheres proto-atmospheres on rocky planets. Uh, and they can be thousands of bars at the surface. So these would be very hot atmospheres, which would be very puffy and, and light and extended. And if you think about the modern Earth uh, as being the size of an apple, the, the Earth's atmosphere would be as thick as just the skin on that apple, so very small. But if you think about an Earth-like planet with a proto-atmosphere like this, the atmosphere could extend many times the radius of the planet outwards. So if you were an observer of one of these planets and you were to look at, say, an Earth-like planet with a proto-atmosphere, you wouldn't see a rocky planet. What you would see is something that looked more like Jupiter in terms of density, uh, but it would just be much less massive. And since we're focused on, on habitability, these planets are not habitable. Uh, in, in any way that I could imagine, the, the temperature at the surface would be much too hot for liquid water to exist. In, uh, to exist. And so if we look at the available exoplanet data, uh, if we, if we look at these, these planets, these small mass planets that we see down here on the lower portion, uh, what we're seeing in this plot is mass versus radius. So each of these dots represents an exoplanet. And if we make the assumption that all planets initially formed with proto-atmospheres, and we say that there's no real barrier for them to form, so if we assume that all planets form with those atmospheres, then we would expect all planets to form along this hydrogen line here or close to it. Uh, and each of these lines you can think of as a contour of constant density. So Planets that you know, are on this hydrogen line have a lot of hydrogen and helium in them. The water is the blue line. And planets, which you see right here, is the Earth and Venus on this rocky line right here. Those are the rocky planets. And so what we see here is that we only have these low mass planets that are falling off of this hydrogen line towards this rocky composition. And if we look at the zoomed in version, which is just the low mass, re the low mass region of this same plot down here, uh, the largest rocky planet that we see is this 55 Cancri E. And that's about 8 to 10 Earth masses. And the radius on that planet is you know, 1.6, 1.7 Earth radii. And this plot is a little bit dated. But uh, even if you were to put the latest exoplanet data on here, the same trend uh, is visible, where this entire portion of this plot is empty. We don't see these large mass rocky planets uh, that just don't exist. So then why is it that these small planets don't have atmospheres, or these thick proto-atmospheres, while these larger mass planets are able to retain those? And so one way that, that, that we've found that can explain that is through uh, atmospheric escape via hydrodynamic escape. And so hydrodynamic escape is a pressure-driven thermal loss process where your atmosphere becomes heated. And in this case, we're considering heating by XUV, where the XUV is X-ray and UV photons from the host star. So that comes in and heats the atmosphere of your planet. The atmosphere starts to expand, and it expands so rapidly that the atmosphere just sort of puffs off into space. So you can remove the entire proto-atmosphere from small planets very quickly uh, via this process on timescales of just a few million years. 
And I borrowed a, uh, an animation of this from the LPL, where you can see this hydrodynamic escape uh, happening to a planet orbiting a sun-like star. And what you're seeing with that, that light blue, that's its atmosphere being blown off from the star. Uh, and this is similar to what happens on comets that enter the inner solar system, where they shed mass to remain in energy balance. So we took the equations that describe this hydrodynamic escape, uh, and we put together a simple uh, uh, energy-limited hydrodynamic escape model uh, where we assume that all these rocky planets are forming with those thick proto-atmospheres, and we put them very close to a sun-like star at 0.1 AU. And we're putting them close in since the goal is to figure out how big a rocky planet can be uh, and, and sort of what will, it, what will it take to evolve it to a rocky planet status. And so putting them close in will make them very hot and expose them to a lot of that UV radiation, uh, which will drive off their atmosphere. Then to calculate the loss rate from a planet, we have to specify seven model parameters, which are shown in this table. So we have to specify the temperature, the XUV flux, uh, the initial atmospheric mass fraction. We need to know the escape efficiency, which you can think of as just being the fraction of that incoming XUV radiation that goes into driving the atmospheric escape. Then the pressure at the base of the thermosphere is where that XUV radiation is absorbed in the atmosphere. You need to know the specific gas constant for the atmosphere, which you can think of as just telling you how light the atmosphere is. And then the XUV saturation time. And so the XUV saturation time is the period during which the host star remains at a peak XUV emissions. And so for sun-like stars, this is about 100 million years. And so during that time, the XUV flux is maximal. And then after that, that period, it dips off exponentially. So most of the mass loss is going to occur during this time. So we can select the, you know, these seven parameters for our model. And if we run it, we generate something that looks like this. So what we're seeing here, again, is the mass versus radius. And this dashed contour here represents an Earth-like density. So any planet that falls below that is a rocky planet. And any planet above it is a low-density planet that we would consider you know, gas-enveloped. And so what we see here is that the small mass planets very quickly lose their atmospheres and fall below this line, while the larger mass planets are able to retain them for extended periods. Uh, and this is dependent on what parameters we select from that table. So we took our model and we ran it for 10,000 parameter combinations and calculated where that cutoff between those rocky and gas envelope planets occurred. And so that's what we see in this histogram here. And so the mean for our model is at this 1.6, 1.7 Earth radii with the, uh, with the error bar showing the one sigma confidence interval on that calculation. The red dot is from the Rogers et al. 2015 paper where they looked at uh, the exoplanet data, and found that there was a transition between rocky and gas envelope planets at about 1.6 Earth radii, with their 95% confidence interval on that measurement. Uh, so what we see here is that there's this strong agreement between what our simple model would predict for the cutoff between rocky planets and what's actually observed uh, in the exoplanet data. And just if we look back at the, uh, at the planet data here again, we can see that it does agree right around that 1.6, 1.7 cutoff. And just to give this a little bit of context of why this is important and why we should care about these rocky planet sizes, well, rocky planets can be habitable, so it's interesting just to know how big they could possibly be. And it's also helpful for future observations, since we often detect exoplanets through a transit, which is shown in this cartoon here. Uh, and the thing that you measure in that is often the dip in the, planet, the starlight as the planet passes in front. And the, the amount of starlight that's blocked tells you the, uh, the radius of the planet. Uh, so often that's all you'll know is just the radius. So being able to determine whether or not a planet is worthy of follow-up studies uh, could be helped in this manner if looking for Earth-like planets. So I'll put up a summary and take any questions. Thank you. Excellent. We have lots of time for questions, so please come up to the microphone if you have questions. Thanks for that talk. That's yeah. uh, really interesting. Uh, I'm going to ask you the question that is not supposed to be asked, which is, what about magnetic fields? Because what I mean is that the, uh, the atmospheric loss from pressure, because I notice a lot of your plots are as a function of radius and mass, but not as a function of distance or insulation flux. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would imagine that under many circumstances, the, the atmospheric loss from, fr from the... Uh, from the stellar wind will uh, be larger than that from the XUV um, processes. But, that so the stellar know. wind could be, uh, could be very effective, especially at these close distances, distances, and that's not something that we've put into the model. Uh, although if it became sufficiently rapid, uh, then you'd be removing materials so quickly that it would actually be a hydrodynamic. Uh, eventually, you'd sort of reach that cutoff if you were removing materials so quickly. So 
I'm not sure uh, how exactly adding magnetic fields in would impact our model. I imagine you, you may slow it down a little bit, and that's definitely an area for future research. But it's not included at all in this, in this model, which we're just looking at the energy limited, uh, sort of thermally driven escape. Uh, but that, is, that yeah. is an excellent point. And we did only look at one orbital distance. We put them at that 0.1 AU, uh, which is sort of an inner limit where you can have a hydrostatically bound lower atmosphere uh, for these planets around sun like stars. OK, thanks. Yeah. Hey, Owen. Uh, nice talk. I was just wondering if you've tested how sensitive your results are to the exact um, escape efficiency that you assume, and if you assume some kind of prior. I noticed that the range was like 0.1 to 0.6 for eta. Yes. Um, did you assume like a flat prior? Did you play around with it? I'm just wondering if, uh, if that's so a we just significant. Used uh, it, it is uh, linear dependence on, on what we assume for that escape efficiency. And so we just looked at a uniform distribution across that, um, which there's probably a better distribution to consider when, when looking at that escape. But for this model, it was just uniform. Uh, and so it's a linear dependence on that uh, with, you know. Yeah, with yeah. I, I think that there are papers showing that for the Kepler population, um, something like 0.1 matches the the population at the population level, median value of 0.1 matches it. So I wonder if that would make your histogram even more consistent with the that's, Rogers that's result. You can play around with that. Oh, thank you. Uh, what about uh, impacts knocking off the atmosphere? A uh, planetoid hits the planet and blows the whole atmosphere away. Uh, yes, so that, that is, could definitely happen if you had two planets collide. You could probably remove an atmosphere very quickly. Uh, impacts do tend to be less important for the larger mass planets. So by the time you reach six to seven Earth masses, uh, it seems less likely that you could have impacts that are removing the entire atmosphere. Uh, so then this hydrodynamic escape becomes more important, which is where we see sort of that final cutoff. But for those lower mass planets especially, then yeah, having impacts could remove your atmosphere very quickly. Thanks, great talk. Uh, I think there, it seems apparent that this is um, sort of an upper limit, as in there are many other ways to remove atmospheres, but I'm actually more interested in the other question is, a number of the planets that are quite low mass seem to have very puffy atmospheres. I mean, a number of them that have been detected clearly within the air bars fit above that range. Not all, I mean, it's only a few, but I guess have you guys thought about ways to actually preserve, even for low mass planets, that puffy atmosphere? Uh, actually, we, we haven't looked at, at how to preserve those atmospheres at this point. And what actually motivated this work was looking at some of those very low mass planets and trying to figure out why they still had atmospheres, since some of them have densities you know, that are less than you know, it's 0 0.05 grams per cubic centimeter or something on, on some of these planets. Yeah. Uh, so we were trying to model initially how those planets could have atmospheres. Uh, and that's where we ended up with, with these escape models that are showing this cutoff between the rocky and gas envelope worlds. But that's a really good question that I think definitely deserves future study is how you can have these really low density, low mass planets that are retaining their thick atmospheres. Do we have? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, following up on Avi's question, uh, mm -hmm. does that preservation of the atmosphere depends upon um, the age of the star or age of system? Because it takes about 100 million years for you to remove the atmosphere, right? Uh, right, so it does depend on the age of the stars. So we're using the XUV flux, which on these sun-like stars is, is really in that peak for about 100 million years. And after that, it's gonna drop off exponentially. So your, your mass loss driven by that flux is gonna drop off with it. So if a planet were to form further out and migrate inwards after that, that XUV saturation, then it would definitely not be subjected to the same level of mass loss. Uh, and that's something that we could consider uh, in this model as well in, in a future uh, run. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.